The conversation you are about to sit in on is by far one of the most interesting and intriguing I've ever been a part of on this podcast. It's with Grant Muller out of Denver, Colorado. And without giving too much away, I'm just going to jump in and start it. And uh, with that, I'm your host and referral partner out of San Francisco, Sean Kunkler. Grant, I am thrilled to have you here today. You have no idea. I, I railed through your book in about two and a half days, and I, days. I feel like there's just so much for us to talk about today. Well, I'm, I'm super excited to have a chance to chat, and thank you for reading the book. Yeah, well, I say read. I did audiobook because I cool. spent a lot of time in my car and in my, my home gym, and but I like I was literally... Like I'd be like making lunch and I'd be like, oh, I got I got 20 minutes here. I'll just listen to a little piece of it. But holy geez, man, your story is so incredibly powerful. Uh, but before we get to that, now that you're a guest on the show, I I'm formally going to invite you. We have a Realtor 180 um, inner circle group and it's it's only access through past guests. And so now that you're a guest, you will have access to it. I'll send you the invite afterwards. Yes. It's all the heavy hitters across the US. And we sit down and chat and collaborate um, every two weeks. And it's awesome. And I, I, I would love it if you can join. I think you'd be a phenomenal addition. That's amazing. Thanks for the invite. Uh, I'm a big believer in community. Yeah. Uh, the right communities. I agree. So I don't even know where to begin. I feel like your story is so wild. You went from l growing up in South Africa to basically becoming a, a millionaire at a very young age to living on the streets and finding yourself in rehab and just rising from the ashes time and time again to get to the point you're at. I honestly don't know where to begin. Where would you like to begin? <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm happy to give you know the three or four minute version of my story for Please. those people who haven't read it. Yeah. Uh, read it. Um, so I, yes, I was born in South Africa. We moved to the U.S. Um, in my early twenties. I was super hyper focused on becoming a millionaire by thirty. That was my goal. I didn't know why that was a goal, but that was the goal. And uh, I ended up at an internet startup. We went public on the stock market. We all got rich. Porsches and Ferraris started showing up in the parking lot. <laughs> and I remember the night we went public, I was sitting in my fancy condo overlooking the skyline of Denver thinking, is this it? Really? You know, have you ever like just really killed yourself for a dream and you uh -huh. got it and you, you felt like maybe it's what you wanted, but it's really not what you needed. And for me, it broke my heart a little to have really? that dream come true. And the thing was, the money didn't make me feel any different about myself. I didn't feel like I thought I was going to feel yeah. when I got the achievement. And so um, I looked for it elsewhere and ultimately found it in cocaine and later meth. Um, I lost everything because I got fired um, pretty quickly. Um, I forgot to exercise my stock options. Oh. Um, and so I lost a million two in one day. And... Um, Ended up on the streets selling drugs to support my habit is the end result of all of that. Uh, and so when I finally got clean, I had been hiding in a crack house from this gang leader who wanted to kill me. Um, I owed him a lot of money and he had gang members looking everywhere for me. And it was basically turn myself into probation and give up or have the, and go to prison for likely four years um, or have this guy find me. And so I was just kind of back up against the wall and um, I gave up. I surrendered and um, I didn't get clean right away. You know, I got clean for a moment and went back to the same thing. And so it wasn't a direct path. Yeah. Um, but through uh, a lot of privilege, uh, a lot of help from family, a lot of luck, um, and also a lot of commitment and hard work from me. Yeah. Um, luckily, the last time I used drugs was February 20th, 2008. So it's been 16 and a half years. That's incredible. Um, yeah. And, and if, if somebody has the opportunity to read the book, it's, it's called Top of Heart. And it's a, I mean, you go into obviously far more details, but it's such a just crazy journey that, and, and every time you, 
I, I'm like, oh, he hit bottom. You go deeper. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, okay, he hit the bottom. And I'm like, holy <laughs> crap, we're going deeper. Find and a shovel and keep digging. That's what I would do. You know, I would just keep, I would keep finding a way somehow to go further. And, you know, yeah. uh, and there is a point of no return. Uh, it's death, um, yeah. by the way. Just, uh, you know, it's death. And I got really close. Um, and so for me, every day is a miracle. And every day alive is gravy at this point in my life, which has given me a really unique perspective uh, and has really helped me in life and in business. And I forget that sometimes. It's easy to forget it in my new house and my new life and, yeah. and all those things. But at the end of the day, every day is a gift. And it, it's, it's that way for all of us. And um, there are many people who've gone, who've gone through so much in their life and can probably relate. Um, you know, we all, we all go through Something. different trials in life. We do. There's, you know, the hardest thing that you go through is the hardest thing you go through. And we all have that hardest thing that we've struggled through. I remember maybe I was 18. I read a book. I was on a, a self-help hit kick and there was a book about a guy uh, who was golfing and he, he had a similar path in life and was in jail. And, and he said, he's on the golf course and in the, in the background, he's playing with these very, affluent group of people, highly successful. And in the background, you can see the prison. And he had a thought to himself, it's easy to go from here to there, but it's really hard to go from there mm. to here. And wow. I, it was one of those things that always just so true. It stuck with me. Um, are you familiar with the term? It's a Japanese word. Um, kintsuki. No, it's, it, 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 it's, it's almost a nickname I'd love to give to you. It's, um, it's the Japanese art of, of, when like say a beautiful pottery piece is then broken the gold they, they mend it back together with gold okay. to make yeah. it better than it was mm. and i and i feel like that's what your 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 whole journey feels like that like it's you took all these fragmented pieces but then made just such a great story in in this chapter out of it and so thank you i appreciate that and yeah definitely uh you know the I always say, uh, you know, I made and lost the first million pretty quickly. Um, but it was also, um, it was easy come, easy go. Uh, and it really wasn't that easy. It was a lot of work. But it was all about Grant. And it was all about how I achieve so that I can feel better about myself. Yeah. Uh, and, and especially in relation to other people. So I can feel superior to others hmm. so that I can hide the shame um, of, of really who I was. I, I felt a lot of shame about myself. Um, I didn't realize that consciously, of course. It took me many years to figure all this out. Yeah. But now this part of my life and, and the money, frankly, as well, and business success is around fulfillment. Um, yeah. and, and what I discovered along the way is that, um, you know, achievement um, is created by fulfillment, not the mm -hmm. other way around. So, you know, we don't get a fulfillment from achievement. We get achievement from fulfillment. We have to be fulfilled first, which sometimes is a challenge. It's, that's, that's such a fascinating way to look at it. If, if you could take us back to that time when you were in the, in the condo looking out and you had arrived, but you weren't fulfilled, what, was, what, was, what were those missing pieces for you? So the first piece was um, I was alone. I had, um, I had destroyed a primary relationship. Um, because I was so driven at work that I didn't care about anything but getting to the goal. So I arrived alone. Um, that was one very big piece. Um, I hated the work I was doing. So I was pretending to be someone I was not every day in this job. Um, it, was, it, it had started with what I love, which is consumer service, yeah. direct service, creating service and um, creating value for people, which I, I loved then and I love now. But it had turned into much more technical work because I was at a tech company. Mm -hmm. um, so it was much more about customer support than it was about service. And so I hated the work, hated it. And I didn't have the confidence then to say, hey, I'm not from this world. I don't understand these things. I need to learn things. I just assumed that I was not smart enough to know these things. So I didn't understand how to develop a skill set. 
um, that these people assumed I had. Um, and I didn't have the confidence to say so. So I was pretending to be someone I wasn't every day. Um, and let's face it, uh, you know, corporate America, we had just gone public. So we'd gone from this very exciting entrepreneurial moment to this bureaucracy, bureaucracy mm -hmm. of quarterly earnings. Um, and so everything went from fun to no fun anymore. Um, and uh, I felt like I was handcuffed by these stock options. I couldn't leave because I had millions more vesting over time. So ultimately, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I took the coward's resignation, right? I just forced them to fire me ultimately. Um, I didn't do any of that consciously. But, um, you know, what we don't want or don't value, we will lose. And that's exactly what happened for me. It's, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, I, I work with a lot of tech being in San Francisco, and they all talk about the golden handcuffs. Yeah. It's, you know, those stock options just keep piling up. But if I leave, I lose them. So yeah, people will unfortunately stay in a place they don't enjoy. I feel like with, with your book, <coughs> excuse me, there's a through line of, uh, I don't, I don't want to use it. It sounds cliche, but the imposter syndrome of feeling like I just don't belong here. And yeah. and it was, I felt that in, in almost every chapter of the book of whether it was doing drugs, you're like, I'm doing it, but I don't belong here. And then you'd, you'd get to rehab and you're like, I don't belong here. And in corporate America, I don't belong here. What do you, cause I, I know we've all felt and experienced that. What is your what was your realization of, of, of the why behind that? I didn't belong with myself. I didn't, I didn't belong. I didn't belong in my own skin yet. I didn't belong. I didn't uh -huh. accept myself. And until we can really accept ourselves, we're not going to find that acceptance outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, similar to belonging is similar to loving, um, you know? And so I think that, um, you know, if, if I did belong somewhere, if I was accepted somewhere, I had so much self-loathing that I just assumed whoever was accepting me was then not worth being accepted by. Because if they were willing to accept me, they couldn't be worth much. They couldn't be that smart or that worthwhile. Hmm. Um, you know, I just had that self-loathing. And um, I don't know where that came from. Uh, and I don't know that it really matters. Um, I was lucky enough to enjoy... I still do unconditional love from both my parents. So um, I hear so many stories of friends who are in recovery telling me just horror stories of childhood. And I didn't have that. So I don't know what the answer was. Um, I think that all that belonging weirdness happened. And I didn't realize this until I finished my book. Um, I think looking back, there was a lot of trauma in moving from South Africa to here and not and truly not belonging or fitting in sure. in second and third grade. And I think that seed over time grew, um, you know, and then as I came out and realized I was gay, um, this was at a time when we were considered an abomination. That was what the was the news of the day when I was coming out was that we were an abomination. And so I think those things just kind of all work together to create this unique cocktail that um, I and, and, and I'm also a very sensitive person. I think I took all of that in, internalized it and made this mess of it. Yeah. Uh, and so um, I was I thought money would solve that problem. Um, I thought that money would buy me access and buy me all the things that would make it OK. And money doesn't do that. Money is like alcohol. It just takes our personality defects and it exacerbates them yeah. and it takes the beautiful things about us and exacerbates them. So, um, I, they're just, it's, it's lighter fluid. <laughs> you know, I, I can, I could not agree more. I think if you're a really good person and you have money, you're going to be a, you're going to be a really good person with money. And if yeah. you're not, you're just going to have a lot more money to be not a good person. Exactly. Or whatever it is in between that. Yes. Um, but that's, yeah, I mean, I can totally understand how, especially at a young, fragile age, moving to a totally different country and starting from scratch of, of just immediately feeling just culturally, I don't belong here. This is, this is foreign to me. And so I must be the problem. 
And because yeah. you don't even have the, the logic or the reasoning or the associate, you don't have any of the tools yet. And so yeah. you just, you have to assign blame to somewhere mm-hmm. where our brains think so. And so, yeah, I can, I can see that. I, I moved around quite a bit as a kid as well after my parents divorced, same town, but new schools. And it's hard. I mean, it's sure. And so I can definitely see where the, where you can go on a, on a, a tangent within yourself which is yeah. it's tricky um wow i i just there's so much to unpack on so many levels with <laughs> with with all of this it's just your journey is is just is just incredible um and and i'll save it for people who want to actually explore the book because I, I i think there's just it's such a gem and there's so many great lessons to be had uh, but if we could pick up from from 2008 when you when you basically started to rise from the ashes and yeah and change just your life's trajectory at that point um i guess i want to jump into the point of your psychology of what were you doing differently at that point to um think differently approach life differently approach your work your happiness your fulfillment what, what did you start doing differently that you continued on from that point? I think, uh, I think it was a, it was a journey like all things. Yeah. And so in 2008, the big thing that changed is I stopped using drugs or alcohol completely. Yeah. Um, that was the big, obviously big shift. And, um, I moved into my first place, uh, which was a storage unit <laughs> wow. and, uh, the storage unit was in Boulder. I had to move from Denver to Boulder because I had these people wanting to kill me. Um, so um, I moved to Boulder. I got a job at Applebee's. Mm. And in my corporate world, uh, I had bought some investment properties over time and had always thought, wow, if you could professionalize what these agents are doing, um, you could really, you could really do well as a realtor. And I'd always wanted to try it, but I hadn't been willing to give up the incomes I had. And so in 2008, I'm living in a storage unit. It is the bottom of the real estate market. It is the bottom of my market. And I thought, wow, what a perfect time to try this thing. And so I picked up a copy of millionaire real estate agent. It's a great book. Um, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a great book. And I, I think that, um, it was foundational for me to understand what's possible, read the book, um, got interviewed by, uh, well, and I'm working at Applebee's and, um, I got interviewed by a team leader at KW, Mm. um, who was very gracious, um, and willing to work with me to get my license because I had to have some letters of explanation, et cetera, for charges on my record. It's, it was not going to be an easy thing. And, but we had all that kind of set up, and decided I would start studying. And I got fired at Applebee's um, because I'm the world's worst server and because I still didn't have a whole lot of conscious restraint, um, kind of told, told off my manager. And so uh, um, I think that's in the book. And so I went to them at KW and said, look, I'm studying for my license. Do you have any job I can do so that I can learn the real estate world while I'm getting my license. I got hired for $9 an hour at the front desk. And um, actually, ironically, the person that hired me um, and the managing broker of that office ended up becoming my business partners in a boutique brokerage we opened a couple years later, which was um, pretty amazing. Uh, So in that time at the front desk, I was also going uh, to recovery meetings almost every night, uh, 12-step recovery meetings. And, uh, and that really started to change me. I started to learn how to show up as I really am. I started to learn the value of a community. I started to learn, um, how to get real for the first time in my life about my struggles, how to ask for help, um, how to be dependable to other people, uh, how to, um, how to be honest, frankly. Um, you know, at that point I was lying just to lie about stuff. I wouldn't even lie because I needed to, um, just nothing about what I said or did was real or true. Hmm. Um, because that's also a defense mechanism when you're living on the streets or selling drugs, 
Um, you never tell somebody where you're going to be, when you're going to be there, because that just sets you up to get robbed or to, um, you know, to have the cops show up. So you have to be really careful. And so I was just a whole, you know, twisted mess of um, what to do. And so many of my behaviors for months after, years after, had to normalize. Uh, you know, there were things I would do that were frankly criminal, allegedly, um, <laughs> on a very light, on a very light level. But just because I didn't, you know, I, I didn't think it was really necessary to pay at the grocery store, you know, things like that, little things. And so it took a long time for me to really um, to develop. But what was happening, um, I ended up getting my license and moved off the front desk job and um, did some transaction coordination for people to kind of build up uh, my income as well as to learn that side of the business. Yeah. I knew I knew I'm not a details guy. I need to learn that. And um, I was going to recovery meetings at night, learning about how to show up as I really am. And then during the day, um, I remember one particular meeting, and I, and I describe it pretty clearly in the book, so I don't want to share it all. But um, basically, it was um, fake it till you make it kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, it was very transactional stuff I was learning. So during the night, I'm learning how to really show up as I really am. And then during the day, I'm learning how to like be the realtor and show up with the right shoes and the right look and the right voice and, and script this conversation and script this conversation. And it felt like this total like juxtaposition that, and, and things weren't fitting. Sure. Um, and I got my first real estate deals running Craigslist ads. This is now 2009 uh, for foreclosure properties. And um, I think I own boulderonsale.com or something. And buyers would click on it to see the list of properties. Mm. I'd give them one or two, and then they'd have to give me their info. And then I'd call them and run them through a script uh, and just push, push, push. Uh, and once in a while, somebody would say yes. And I got a few clients that way. Because as you can imagine, I didn't know any people in my network who were going to buy or sell houses. Sure. Uh, they, were, they were interested in buying and selling other stuff. And so I had no choice, really. And so I got a few clients that way. And then one day, um, someone called up and said, hey, um, so-and-so told me to call you, said you're a great agent. I'd like to buy a house. Would you be able to help me? And I started taking him through my script. And he interrupted me and said, no, no, no. I don't, I don't need to be sold. Like, if he says you're good, you're good. Uh, just help me find a house, dude. And I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. And so I helped him find a house. He referred me to some, somebody else. And I thought, this is the way to go. Like, mm -hmm. this is, it's about relationships. Um, I want to do this relationship stuff. Well, in my own way, uh, because I'm a super driven person, uh, and because at the time I was paying about $3,000 a month for a coaching program, um, I went all in on relationships. But relationships for me didn't mean relationships. It just meant, okay, if I need to get paid based on relationships, I need the most relationships. And so I was having sometimes two or three breakfasts in a morning, coffee, breakfast, breakfast, lunch, lunch, dinner, dinner. I mean, I was meeting people. I was seeing people shaking hands, kissing babies. You would have thought I was running for mayor. I mean, it was crazy making phone calls, just always busy, always on, um, showing up as the important realtor that I was. So in Boulder, I had no money, of course, no money. So uh, in Boulder, when I got that front desk job, they wanted me to dress up. And this is also back when you wore kind of a tie in that role, yeah. you know, at the front desk. And there was this guy in Boulder, which is really weird in Boulder, but he was just my size. And he had given all his clothes to Goodwill. And um, I took all of them. I had a dollar a shirt or something, but they were all French cuffs. Um, I mean, Love super it. high end stuff. So I looked, and especially in Boulder, I stood out like a sore thumb, but I looked like a million dollars, right? <laughs> um, and I was so dressed up, but it was only because that's all I could afford. I wasn't trying to be fancy, but it kind of helped me a little bit. But I kind of took on this demeanor of, you know, the important realtor. And, you know, I was in my 30s, I was older. Uh, you know, I could, I could look a little more. I'm serious, like I'd been experienced. And uh, so I got a few clients that way, but it was exhausting because I, I was pretending. Yeah. I, and I remember uh, one of my clients, we did a closing and he said, oh, you want to go um, grab lunch and celebrate? And I was like, are you kidding me? 
you're not going to buy another house with me. I didn't say this out loud. But I'm thinking, you just closed a deal with me. You're not going to buy another house for a long time. Go away. I need to move on. And that's kind of how I thought about relationships. Interesting. So even though I thought I was in relationships and I, and I heard you applaud that, I was still just thinking transactionally. Interesting. It was just, yeah. yeah. So it took me a long time to develop what became Top of Heart. It took me a long time to get there. Interesting. So, um, and I, I think a lot of people, that's the case. Um, there's a very popular, very popular um, sales training program that I've learned a lot from that I really enjoy. Um, and it's great. And it teaches based on relationships. But when you look very closely, a lot of the relationship stuff is about setting it up so the agent gets what they want mm -hmm, mm -hmm, rather mm -hmm. than the person getting what they want. Yeah. And so it's not quite true. It's not quite true to relationships. And there's a lot of that in our industry. Let's build relationships, but let's use a script. And then at the very end, oh, by the way, yeah. who do you know that might need to buy or sell a house? I hate months? that ending. There's a that, lot of that stuff out there. Uh, yeah. I, and they call that relationships. And it's any conversation is, is about to wrap and then there's an ask. That's not a relationship. It's like you just invested this money into a savings account. And then at the end, you just withdrew that plus and, Plus more. And there's nothing yeah. left. Yeah. And yeah. the next time you do it, you're going to be negative and then do it again. You're more negative. negative. And you you're actually negative right from the start because you're overdrawing. You're overdrafting right there. Right and, out of the gate. And you've just taken everything. And so, and by the way, um, I actually don't think there's anything wrong with calling and saying, hey, Sean, this is Granite Compass. Um, how have you been? How's the house? Great. Hey, here's why I'm calling. Sure. Frankly, this market is X, Y, and Z, and I'm looking for, you know, LMN. How can you help me? Yeah. You know, if you're going to ask the question, just ask it. Yeah. Um, but also, if you haven't invested the social capital, then you're just going to be overdrafting. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's in my opinion, it's not dissimilar from that that person who's like, "Hey, can you help me move something this weekend?" And then they call you again, and they're like, "Hey, can you now help me?" you know, put it together and then they call you again. Yeah. Hey, can you help me move it to blah, blah, blah. And then they call you again. And eventually you're not going to take their you're call. You're not going to answer the phone. It's the same thing. Yeah. Um, there's a great Tony Robbins quote, which I was fortunate enough to hear early in my career and adopt is relationships are not a place to go and get something. They're a place to go and give. Yeah. And that it, it, as soon as that clicked for me, I realized that all the outbound relationships that I have is I'm not going to ask for anything. And if I do, I'm going to put so much into that savings account that when I make a withdraw, it's going to be so minimal to the compounding interest that it's going to have no impact or it's, or I should say it's not going to have a negative impact. And so I love that. I love that. I will add something to that though. Please. Um, so because, because I live on the extremes, right? Um, that's where I noticed that about you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And so, so then what I did is I went, oh, I'm being too transactional. Mm. I'm going to be all relational. And there was a time I remember refusing to help somebody because they were a friend of mine. And I was so scared then of being that guy and being transactional mm. that I said, oh, I, I really feel like we're too close. Um, um, but I'm happy to refer you to another agent. <laughs> Wild. Like, so I went all the way on the other side. And there are people like that. I actually, a lot of people that coach with me are attracted to my message because they don't want to be that guy. They yeah. don't want to be salesy and pushy, right? So a lot of times I have to help them understand that if you're worried about being that guy, you'll never be that guy. You know, it's more like they've got, I've got to help them move a little bit in the yeah. other direction. Um, but, but I think that uh, if we look at, I mean, you talk to all the top agents. There are so many ways to make money in this business. There is. But most top agents are doing a huge amount of repeat clients and referrals from clients. Yep. And it's just, an, I can't tell you how many, I talk to agents all over the country all the time like you do. And they're always telling me, um, if, if I do an initial call with them, they'll tell me about one or two really exciting things they're working on that's going to be the next thing, right? Yep. And they'll tell me all about it or, or that's working really well for them and they're really proud of it. And then we'll break down their numbers. How many deals did you do last year or 22? Okay, great. Of those 22, tell me where they came from. Yep. 
Well, 21 of them came from repeat clients and referrals from clients. Yeah. And one came from this cool thing I do. And it's like, well, why not lean into the thing that's already working, right? Um, my story, my version of that is in 2014 or so, somewhere around there, I was really excited about like, hey, I'm doing well, making a great living. I want to take a big amount of that money and I want to, I want to scale, baby. I want to go big. So I hired the radio guy, um, not the radio guy for real estate, the secondary one, because there's somebody who's really big that I, I, I'm not trying to call anybody out, um, but somebody who was really proud of his system and his process. And um, I think it was like $4,000 a month. He said, if I give it four months, that'll be a fair amount to give it. Mm. And um, I had this popular radio DJ here in town who was going to do the testimonial. That was the strength of the ad. And I developed a relationship with her. We did, she did the testimonials. I got two calls. One um, was a total scam. And then the other one, the guy had a, <laughs> like a $400,000 lien on a $300,000 house or something. It was, oh, jeez. Um, however, the DJ loved what I was doing. She became a client. She referred a client. She did a repeat deal with me. So I actually made money on those radio ads. But I made them from the relationship. <laughs> I didn't make them from the radio ads. Wild, isn't it? It's so wild. And that's when I realized, okay, I need to lean in there, put all my effort into really building the relationships. And that's when things started taking off for me. So. I, I love that you shared that. I Years ago, right before the pandemic, I threw an event. It was a garden party. And we, ha we hired a band. I hired a photographer. Um, a lender sponsored it. We had a bunch of drinks. I invited a bunch of clients. The crazy thing that transpired from that is the photographer bought a house with me. The singer bought a house. The drummer sold and bought a house. Wow. It, it was like the, the people that I actually hired to be there, wow. I built a relationship. I built a relationship with and They're the ones who had transactions. And then, yeah. I, of course, I had numerous clients who attended who then yeah. uh, sold and bought. Yeah, but it that that was like one of my little like aha moments of it's about the relationship and you know when we think about relationships or we think about even let's say movie characters it's usually the the other things about the character that we like it's the flaws at what point which I'll just frame it or preframe it with it's on on the surface it seems like risky to say hey this was my past life and i'm going to put it out there for everybody to know and knowing like in advance of that's going to probably turn off some people and it'll be fine with other people when did you get to the point where you were good with yourself in saying that was me. That's not me now. I've, I've evolved and I'm okay sharing this. I don't think it was about my level of comfort in sharing it. Hmm. I think it was more my drive to make sure that um, if there was somebody that I could help with my story, that they heard it. And so it was my, my drive to help um, truly to make sure that I could make a difference with my story um, and turn my story into something that could be valuable and um, that could help others. That mm -hmm. just drove me past the fear of how I would be judged. Um, you know, this book took three years to write yeah. um, because I had to put it down for six months. I traumatized myself so much from writing the book that I'm still, I'm in therapy. I wasn't in therapy before. I'm in therapy once a week because there was stuff, the book is only... The stuff that's in the book is all the is all the light stuff. Yeah. You know, underneath all of that stuff is the really scary stuff I couldn't yeah. write about that came up while I was writing it. Um, so, but what made me push through that was knowing, um, you know, there's somebody out there who is whose kid is struggling. And, I, and by the way, people reach out all the time. That's made it so you know worthwhile to me. Mm. There's somebody out there that's kid is addicted or mom is addicted um, or um, you know, there's, there are a lot of realtors, frankly, with, you know, a lot of substance issues. And sometimes it's not substances. Sometimes it's something different. Um, but, but we all have struggles. And so, um, and, and also there are a lot of agents out there who feel like they should be doing something different mm -hmm. to build a business. 
and they're they're paying coaches or they're learning from programs and they feel bad that they're not being consistent with the work they're supposed to do in it, but it's because it's not consistent with who they are. And so I just wanted to give people permission to create a business around how they want to live and people to have permission to create a life that they want to create. So, so it really wasn't ever that I was like, oh, I'm comfortable now and ready to share my story. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel so good about myself that I'm okay taking the arrows. It was just more that I was called to, to share the story. I, and I really like the way that you said it, it drove you past the fear. Yeah. That's it. That's such a, an interesting way to share that. And I, I was working on a, a writing project as well. And I can only imagine because when you're telling the stories, you're feeling the stories and the more that you're feeling, the better the writing becomes. And it's, it's hard. It's. Yeah. I, um, then, uh, so then I got, I got through that. I wrote the book and I didn't read it for a year. And then I had to read it again for the audio book. Oh gosh. And to, to add emphasis to it and to, you know, to tell some of those stories, I had some pretty visceral physiological responses to some of the stuff, which was really cool and healing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's all healing, um, but it was pretty it was pretty powerful. So I'm glad when I hear, you know, from somebody like you that you've you listened to it and that, um, you know, me narrating it was was good and a good choice versus paying somebody else to do it. Yeah. Um, it makes me happy that that makes a difference. I, you know, I, I genuinely, I appreciated hearing you narrate it because I, I know you and I knew it was your story. And, and so I, I felt it's, it's more congruent, especially with your story for to have, story. to have you do it, to actually hear your voice. But yeah. my gosh, it's heart wrenching at parts. You're just like, <laughs> Oh my God. And then again, it's like, it's not going to get any worse. And you're like, Oh, I spoke too soon. <laughs> Here we are. Wow. Okay. And then it goes, it goes a layer deeper and you're like, Holy shit. Just stop digging, man. <laughs> and, and you know, the message, Sean, I said this on stage the other day. Uh, gosh, I try not to be too emotional, but I was that junkie on the street that you walk past and they're mumbling to themselves and they look just out of their mind that was me, you know? Um, and so I just want everybody to remember that humanity because I've, I, I'm in a, I'm in a version of me that's more acceptable, socially acceptable, if you will. Sure. And so I want to use this platform of just being a socially acceptable person to say, Hey, that person is somebody's son or dad or brother, and they're just struggling. Nobody chooses that for themselves, no. regardless of what the messages might be out there. And so um, I think, first of all, keep your distance. I don't think it's necessarily safe. I'm not suggesting that you give everybody a hug that's in that situation. Um, as you read, you know, I was a pretty dangerous, erratic person yeah. at times. Paranoid uh, and the whole Yeah, and exactly, exactly. Um, but at the same time, um, I just think it's important to remember that it's not – it's not that many bad decisions or that many unfortunate circumstances to take anybody from a certain place to a certain place. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it's, it's pretty amazing how quickly it happens. And one thing that maybe is a, a different book, but is it, it was amazing to watch uh, my little drug community you know, we would watch the people, and I wrote about this kind of slightly, but we'd watch the people, the weekend partiers who would come to us to buy drugs and then go, and, and we'd watch them fall. Um, you know, and I'm talking about sheriffs, you know, DAs. I'm talking about um, a very high-level executive, um, school teachers and principals, and watching them do things on the on the weekend level and then some of them would be fine and you'd never see them again, but many that would fall and you'd watch them and watch them. Oh, I'll never do that. Oh, I'll never do that. Oh, I'll never do that. And they keep crossing the lines and breaking the promises to themselves and slowly bit by bit. And sometimes very quickly, um, you know, your life has changed completely and you've lost access to your children, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's, you know, not to be too dark, but um, I think it's just an important message that, that we all should be so grateful for what we have and make sure we protect it and you know, be thoughtful about it. Yeah, I, I, I definitely 
yeah, there there should be a level of gratitude that we have. Even we're we're always striving for more, but taking inventory of what we actually have and the people we have in our lives and who loves yeah. us. And you're right. And even reading the book, and you talk about it, it it starts like with a drink, and then it starts with well, like I'll have a little bit better of a time if I do this. So then you do a little bit more of this, and then you know once in a while it becomes more frequent and then it becomes daily and then and then that stops working so then it it's just this sad snowball effect yeah and um yeah and i think on the other side is you know we never know where somebody's at and it's just i think just giving people grace like you have that client who's who's a raging lunatic and they're lashing out it's not you it's they have something else happening and we aren't privy to it all the time and it's you know it could be this it could be they're 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 dealing with a struggling family member with in the same situation or they just lost somebody or who knows yeah Yeah. and it's i think i think you know in general just on a national level i think we've lost we've kind of lost view and vision of just giving some people grace and yeah just yeah, love people at a distance sometimes, but yeah, and and a lot of uh, I think people sometimes need a reminder that there are good people in the world, and if I we could be that reminder, um, then that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I mean, I I I love the quote. It's a JFK quote: "Is a rising tide lifts all ships," mm-hmm. and and you know, in in your book, if it if it helps one person, that's amazing, and that's mm-hmm. I think that's a that's a, just such a beautiful gift and legacy that you're leaving the world. Um, And let's, I want to kind of talk, merge this a little bit into real estate and your realizations of the relationships and what you've unpacked. And we kind of briefly talked about it, but you, you talk about mindset, skill set, and heart set. Let's unpack that. So um, in each of mindset, mindset has a few pieces, skill set has a few pieces, and heart set has a few pieces. Mm. Um, so I'll just describe one for each. Please. Um, that, that was some of my favorites. So in mindset, um, and that's kind of the top apart framework. So top apart is built on top of top of mind. So top of mind is no like trust. And um, we still need to be in front of people. We need them to know about us. We need to be top of mind with people, et cetera. But my argument is that's just not good enough. Um, So if we're sending the postcard and the email newsletter every day to our client, or not every day, but, you know, regularly, once a month, whatever. Um, When the realtor moves in next door and they become neighbors and friends, suddenly the top of mind doesn't really matter because they become top of heart with that next door neighbor. Great point. So so when we have a top of heart relationship, we have like a, a community um, we're the agent for, and we just have this deep relationship and connection, and it's a beautiful thing. So mindset is the first part of that. And um, on the mindset side, uh, I touched on this earlier. It's just a mindset of relational versus transactional. Mm. So it's about what they want versus what we want. I often say if all roads of your sales process lead to what you want, it's not sales that's manipulation. True. Um, so having a mindset about relational, what, what they want, um, thinking about relationships not bound by the length of the transaction, but, but just extended beyond the transaction. So what I mean by that is we all have clients uh, at some point in our journey. We've closed a client and then a year and a half later thought, holy cow, I haven't reached out to them once. Yep. And it's so common. And so um, I have – as an example in the in relational um, process, I have a seven day call I do for all my buyer clients. I call them at day seven and I say, I ask two very difficult questions. One, how's the house? And two, is there anything I can help with? And the reason they're difficult is they always create work for me. I'm almost like, <laughs> like I'm always calling going, and is there anything I can help with? And there's always an answer, yes. But here's the thing, I'm there in that moment when they need something. And at day seven, they know I was paid seven days ago. And they know that they're the least likely person in the city of Denver to buy a house. True. So they know I'm calling only because I care. So I call this the golden hour of referrals because this is where so many of my referrals end up coming from. Not in that call, but that's where they start. That's where that real relationship starts beyond the transaction. 
So that's a mindset skill set. You know, we can we can have the mindset of being relational. We can show up as we really are. We can be great agents. But if we're not good at what we do, you know, if we still suck, it's not good enough. So no matter how good our mindset is and how great we are in that relationship piece, if we're not willing to deliver the goods and show up with excellence, it's not going to make any difference. So yes, I want to talk about mindset and being who you really are and all that stuff, but you got to have the skill set. And so, sure. you know, I always ask agents, you know, do you know your market or do you know your market? Um, and I think for each of us, we bring different natural skill sets to the table. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So as an example, I'm not going to be your stats guy. If you want to know the year over year comparisons, call somebody that cares. I don't care. I don't like stats. I don't want them. I know a couple of stories to tell you about how the market is. Sure. But as far as like the real detailed stuff, that's just not who I am. That's not what I bring to the table. I'm also not the agent who walks into a house and helps you envision taking down a wall. I don't have that kind of vision. I don't know. As I go through this, I'm always like, how am I an agent? Um, but, but what I'm really great at is negotiation. So I am one of the best negotiators in the city of Denver. I mean, I'm so proud of it. And I've spent hours and hours and hours working on it. And um, I'm, I, that's, that's the skill set I bring. I'm super geeky about how we present listings. And um, I've built a marketing package that's really amazing. And I get excited about it. So that's the skill set I bring. Each of us needs to find the skill set that we love. Yeah. Not that our coach wants, not that our managing broker thinks we should have, not that our, our team leader thinks we should have, but what we, like, where we like to geek out. Mm -hmm. And I know agents who do a great amount of business, and they're the ones that just know where the parties are, where the restaurants are, where the bars are. You know, they know the nightlife, and that's their thing. Yeah. I think we have to find our thing and become the best in the industry at it. So that's skill set. Um, heart set is about developing real, genuine, emotional relationships with people. And the way I describe that is just building the relationship and allowing the relationship to happen the way it wants to. It doesn't mean being friends with all our clients. I'm actually an outgoing introvert. I don't want to have a ton of friends. But allowing the relationship to find its own natural course. And sometimes that means, um, you know, I have some clients who just want me to open doors every time they buy or sell a house. Yep. And, and they appreciate me and value me, but that's what they need me for. And I don't hear from them in between. <laughs> and then I have um, some clients I talk to a couple times a month, at least. Um, we become more like friends and some that are true, genuine friends. But so having those real genuine relationships. And so my favorite part of heart set is authenticity. Um, I call it getting real because I think authenticity is just so overused as a buzzword. I agree. But just showing up as we really are, just being who we really are. Um, and, you know, we talked about how much do you share about yourself? You know, I allow when the relationship goes deep and people ask me what my life has been like, I'm going to I'm going to share my story, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I know that if somebody Googles me, if they've been referred to me, a lot of times they'll Google me and they might know that I've written a book and not know much about it. Or they might have read, you know, my grantmuller.com website, which is not my real estate website and learned a bit more than they wanted to about me. Um, and so being open to that is great. But also, it's not about me. So, you know, really leading with a genuine interest in the other person first. Yeah. Um, so um, Bob Berg, uh, who's a great friend of mine and mentor who wrote The Go-Giver. Mm. Um, That's you know, a phenomenal um, book. Your income is determined by how, and if you'd like him as a guest, remind me to make an introduction. Oh, he's, my gosh. I, I love that book. I would love that. He's, uh, he's become, um, gosh, I'm really emotional today. Um, he's become, he's an unbelievable friend and mentor to me. He is the living embodiment of the go-giver. You know, mm. they say, don't meet your heroes. Uh, I got to meet him and, and now, as I said, we're so close and, um, he's everything that, that you'd hope he would be. So I will absolutely make that introduction, but your income is determined. One of the laws of the go-giver is your income is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Yeah. And um, it doesn't mean that we set aside our interests completely. We just set them off to the side for a moment. Yeah. Um, you know, I want, I love money. I'm not ashamed of that. I think we should talk about it. I have a, a beautiful money mindset. I know the beautiful things I get to do with money, uh, which is to help and serve others and also to buy fancy fun stuff for myself. And that's all okay. 
Um, but I have to set aside that, you know, um, 0. 0.0 whatever times, <laughs> whatever the dollar amount of the property is for just a moment in the interest of serving the person in front of me. So that's, that's heart set. Oh, that's so I, I, I love all of that. And I love the seven day question. I actually or two questions. I wrote them both down. And once we hang up, I'm going to that's being implemented today. Awesome. I love that. I, I love that. I think it's so good. And I, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's so often, you know, we get caught up in our business and we forget the human aspect and we forget to go back to the people who actually mean things to us. And, and those buyers are incredibly important. And so yeah. Can I tell you, a, do we have time for a quick story? Yeah, please. Um, so one of my early listings uh, opportunities was a really exciting opportunity. And I don't even remember how I got it. It was not through a referral. Um, I think it might have been, um, I had learned working at the front desk to be really nice to the front desk person. And I think they probably handed me um, a, a sign call or something. And Love so it. I'm walking up the driveway to this listing and it is going to be my biggest listing of all time. It's full frontal flat iron views in Boulder. I mean, so exciting. I'm counting my commission on the way up, just calculating in my head. Um, it's more than I'd made the whole year before. <laughs> and um, the, when the door opens, there are four adults there. And I thought that was kind of weird, but I hadn't been on a lot of listing appointments. I didn't think anything of it. Give me the tour, sat them all down at the dining room table, pulled out my iPad, which back then was a big deal. Yeah. Took them through the marketing presentation. I'm so slick and so cool. My cufflinks and all that stuff. And uh, a couple of minutes in, they start looking at each other kind of weird. And like something's going on and I kept going and then they'd look at each other and look back at me and I have got something on my shirt. What's going on? So finally I stopped and said, hey, what's up? And the one lady said, you know, that door right there is where dad carried mom across the threshold over 50 years ago. Mom died. Dad just agreed to move into assisted living. And um, we all grew up here. We're siblings. We had our first crushes here, our first breakups here. We moved out um, of this house to launch our adult lives. And dad only has two requests for the sale of this house. He wants it to be sold while he's still alive. And he wants it to go to someone who will love it like we did. We don't care about the stuff you're talking about, about maximizing price. We don't care about your marketing. We don't care about how easy it's going to be to sell the house. But you wouldn't know that, would you? If you didn't ask. Yeah. Wow. And um, Powerful. It, was, it was tough. And it was a tough lesson. I did not get that listing. Uh, but... I will always remember that. And it taught me a valuable lesson. I was so busy trying to be impressive yeah. that I didn't connect with what was most important to them. Um, and so I always, t I tell that story a lot, by the way. So if you've heard it, excuse me. Um, but it really changed a lot for me. And it really helped me understand that. And, and the funny part was my natural instinct was to come in and go, Hey guys, what's going on? What's the problem? How can I fix it? Like, that's just how I, I work. Like, that's how I roll. I don't want to do the presentation anyway. Um, just tell me what's going on. I'll, I'll think off the cuff. And so to this day, I don't do a presentation. I just have a conversation. And Same. I was just learning what I thought. You know, I'd learned something at a seminar and thought that was how you're supposed to do listings. That's how you were supposed to be the big deal. And for some people, by the way, they do beautiful jobs at that and they should continue. Yeah. Um, if that works for them, they should continue that. But for me, it didn't work. It sounds like it doesn't for you either. And um I learned a valuable lesson. That I so powerful, and thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, I did the same thing, not to the same to the same level, but I did the whole dog and pony show. And I had these like all these books with all the market analysis and all my my razzle dazzle, and I realized pretty pretty quickly. I w I, I do it now. I show up and I pull them out and I'll present them and say, I want to show you, I did all my market research and here are all the plans. I'm going to leave these with you, but I don't want to talk about that. Let's talk about you. How can I help? And I, and, I, and, and just love it. You know, the, it's the rule of seek first to understand and, and, and figure out what do they want? What do they need from me? And how can I love do that? It. One of my best listing presentations, and you reminded me of it is the, the family, similar they owned i think for like 40 plus years 
the husband was an artist and there was art everywhere. And I did the same thing. I was like, I have the books, I have all this. And, and I was like, I love that piece over there. Tell me more about that. And we wound up doing a tour of the, the art in the home oh, for love probably an yeah. hour and a half. And I was like, I loved it. Like I, I actually have one of the pieces at my home. They were moving hey. and they were like, Hey, we're, we're going to leave this, you know, you can just throw it. And I was like, actually, do you mind if I keep it? I, I really, Beautiful. I love it. And I, it's, it's sitting on my, there's a little landing on my stairs and it sits right there and it's been with me that's for so years. Cool. And uh, that's the richness, right? Like yeah. if we miss that, that's the richness we have in our job. Yeah. And so few people get to enjoy that richness in their work. And it's that's true. the positive side of the tough side of our business, which is the human side. That also makes our job very difficult, very stressful, very emotionally taxing at times. Yeah. So if we're going to close out, why would we foreclose on the best part of that, of that it's piece? Um, we've got to enjoy that. I mean, gosh, I don't know about you, but I know people all over the country that I could pick up, you know, a phone call and, and talk to in a moment's notice, whether they're agents or past clients or clients. And it's just so beautiful that we've got to meet. We get to meet so many incredible, incredible people. So uh, same page. I, I think that's the, the joy. The joy that I find is actually connecting with people, hearing their story, yeah. learning what they're doing, learning what they've been through. The, listening to how they figured out how they arrived to where they're at. And it's just, that's actually the most enriching part of this. And that's, yeah. that's the big catalyst behind all these podcasts. Like I, I, yeah. I love this part of it. And it's the same when I'm sitting with my clients, like, like, tell me more about that. Like, tell me about your journey. Like, you're not just buying four walls. Like, what do you tell me, share, share your story with me. I'd love it's to important. hear it. Yeah. Um, oh, that's so cool. Because that's, uh, you know, that's at the end of it, that's people, people really want to connect. That's a human, it's a human need and they want to be heard. And so yeah. give them the space for that. I think that's yeah. just, that's part of life. Um, man, Grant, this is, it's, this has been awesome. It this has seriously been one of my, my favorite roller coaster rides talking to you and, and, <laughs> Thank you. and, um, reading your book. It's, it's wild. Again, it's called top of heart. I'll leave the link in the in the show notes. So if anybody wants to check it out, they can. Um, but I certainly appreciate your time. And I look forward to sending you. the invite to the inner circle. Thank you so much. I will uh, share if you don't mind a little plug. Yeah, please. Um, uh, so if you go to top of heart dot com, top of heart dot com, you can buy the ebook for I think it's seven bucks. Hmm. Um, and I recorded five fast start video bonuses to go along with the ebook so that you can, you don't have to just read the whole book to get to the business stuff. I've got a listing piece in there, a piece about referrals, um, top of heart, quick start. So I've got a bunch of different pieces, my million dollar um, work plan or something. Hmm. So I've got some videos in there and they're short videos because we don't have attention spans these days. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's one thing you can get. I think for $11 more, you get the audio book. Um, but, you know, no, no obligation, but if somebody wanted to do that, it's a super inexpensive way to get access to my stuff. That's um, incredible. I will make sure yeah. we leave that in the show notes. Cool. Um, and then really quick, I don't know if you could see it over my shoulder. I have a couple books. They're my favorite books. The, the screen is bl or the background's blurry, uh, but the go giver is actually sitting right, oh, that's amazing. literally right behind me. That's really cool. If you love the go giver, you have to read the go, go giver sell more. Okay. Um, it's the green book. And it takes the five principles and then puts them in such a more practical, useful, applicable piece, especially as realtors. My version is so highlighted that it's pointless because it's all highlighted. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all like this neon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to introduce you to Bob. I'm really excited about making oh, that connection. I thank you yeah. for that. I appreciate it. Sure. Awesome, man. Well, that is, that's a wrap. Awesome.